Thank you. Ho hopefully you can hear me. Um, what I'd like to try and do today with some information that my colleague Carl Copenhafer and I have put together is to somewhat challenge you in terms of thinking what you mean when we talk about computational simulation. Um, there are reasons for that. The landscape's changing. And if you're a person in the audience there who's concerned with improving your technology while simultaneously reducing costs of development, increasing quality, and increasing on-time delivery, then hopefully at the end of this you'll see that if you're doing modeling and simulation now, you probably should be thinking about doing more of it. And if you're a subject domain expert in the audience, hopefully you'll see at the end of this that in the future you're probably going to be busier than you are now. So job security is important here. So the overall message that we want to give is it's not just what you do, i.e. modeling and simulation, it's also why you do it. And it also feeds then into the way that Svante started the uh, conference, which is modeling and simulation really is for everybody. So over the last uh, 30 years, we've been involved in multi-physics simulations, and for the last 12 years, we've been uh, partners with Comsol in the Certified Consultant Scheme. And we want to share with you some of the lessons that we've learned over that, some of the way that we've seen things change in the modeling and simulations, particularly as it re relates to product development and technology development. So based on that experience, we're going to pull out some background information, give, just give a historical perspective so that everybody's on the same, has the same view. And from that, potentially develop a, a view of some things in the future associated with computational simulation apps. Uh, and then move on to addressing one of the issues that was raised earlier in the conference, which is how can these be deployed for use by the general user as well as by the specific user. And then I'm, I'm going to do something which is uh, not quite as brave as Svante did. I'm not doing a live demonstration, but we're going to give you a demonstration of one of the apps that we've been developing and is due for release commercially. So if we look back uh, at where product and process development has traditionally taken place, originally it was generally led by larger companies who had the infrastructure and the finances to be able to support that. They were focused on probably three things, reducing risk, increasing quality of product, and reducing the cost of production. As such, things tended to be done incrementally. There was no quantum leap. Everything was evolutionary. And there was a heavy bias towards using physical prototypes with a lot of testing and evaluation that then had to take place. That then got cascaded down the supply chain to their suppliers, their tier one, tier twos. Everything in this became time consuming from the initial concept to the final implementation. Part of that was also due to the fact that the prototypes being used, they're time consuming to build and test, and they're expensive to build and test. So there started to be some recognition that things had to change. You can't envisage going on crashing $100,000 cars just to get incremental improvement in the impact resistance. And perhaps an even more profound example, you can't envisage doing nuclear power design by testing and evaluation and fixing the flaws that you find as you move forward. So those are some of the things that then started to drive modeling and simulation. And some of the leading companies, the larger ones, started to, to use this in the um, 80s more as a tool for development of technology. You can see some examples here and some quotes that people gave about the improvements that they were seeing whether that's sporting goods manufacturers where they're now taking a two-year development cycle and have ultimately now turned that down into the fact that your latest golf driver is now a fashion statement that you have to have a new one every year. Tire manufacturers have significantly reduced the cost of their developments. Obviously, aircraft manufacturers use it extensively and have reduced prototype builds and testing. And even the humble maker of the Pringle chip was able to redesign the natural airfoil system they have there so that they could increase production speeds and stop the, the Pringle chip flying off the conveyor belt. <clears throat> so the larger companies recognized this for a long time. Um, but more recently, uh, over the last two, three, four years, it started to cascade down. Other people started to use computational simulation. And it's important that they do that now because if you look across the revenue stream for, for various companies, 
It's estimated that new products and technology account for about 30% of the revenues on an annual basis. Now, this all means that innovation has to continue. It can't be stagnant. You can't just have a one-off innovation that's going to cascade. You have to do it every year, and it has to be repetitive. And that means that it's owned by many people, not just a single individual or a single company, who then passes it down. Because of the rapid turnover that's required to maintain this growth, time and cost of development become important. You can no longer have something that takes a long time to develop, you have to get to the point where you can prove whether or not your technology is viable very early so that you can turn what is called fail fast before you've got a massive investment in pro physical prototypes, physical plant, or the cost of investment and marketing. So all this has led now to trying to limit prototype building and testing and eliminate that as a mechanism for imp improving and developing technology. The final thing is that Technology is now much more complex than it was before. We're actually dealing with real-world problems that are inherently multiphysics, and you need to solve that multiphysics to be able to move forward. So what that has shown is that there's now an emerging group of companies that are termed this best-in-class, and this is the wake-up slide to see if anybody is actually paying attention, um, who are now taking a view that they cannot continue with the traditional ways, you have to be able to make use of your knowledge and capability to innovate and develop and stand out from the rest of the, the, uh, the class if you're going to start to be commercially successful. So that differentiation um, has been going on and <clears throat> if you now look at some statistics that were developed where they studied over 500 companies and they took the top 20% as the so-called best in class. And they were looking at three areas in terms of launch date for new products, cost of new products, and quality. And these are how close you are to what you targeted uh, originally. And you can see that the best in class, the blue bars here, are all around about 90% in their ability to achieve targets of date, cost, and quality. You then have the average figures in red, which are some 20 points behind in all of those categories. And then you have the stragglers in green who are way behind compared to the rest of uh, the industry. Now, these stragglers are probably the people who, the only reason they have a colored TV is because you can't buy a black and white one. So they're very rarely going to be looking to innovate, to adapt, to adopt, to new, use new capability. But what you notice here is that there's a complete differentiation between this top 20% and the rest of the group. The other thing that's interesting is that in terms of quality, these scores are all very high. And that's a cascading effect from the 1780s where quality was always job one. But now what we're seeing is that things like launch date and cost of development are more important if you're going to be a successful company. The other thing to notice in here is that the 20% number chosen to identify this best in class is very close to that number that people generally use for the tipping point between early adopters of a technology and market cascade gen generically through the market. So this is representing now the fact that you use these capabilities, you've been an early adopter, but now the growth is going should now be much more consistent uh, an increase from this particular point. So again, it's not just a case of what you do in terms of modeling and simulation, it's why you do it. The thing that's driven a lot of this uh, is really twofold. One of which is, with products and technology being more complex, you have to be able to solve those problems. Fortunately, software has taken leaps in being able to do that from simplified ways of sequentially coupling these real-world problems to now fully coupled solutions. And we're fortunate to be part of that community that uses the console solution to this. So now we can accurately represent those real-world technologies. You can address technical capabilities across a wider range of areas and provide benefit. The other thing that's driven it is acceptance of computational analysis across a broader spectrum. 
as well as improvements in hardware and the reduction in cost of hardware. We all know how cheap um, memory is now. So taking this virtual prototyping effect rather than testing and evaluation, you can now also break that down into the benefits that people are seeing by taking computational analysis compared to physical prototyping approaches for either prototypes, uh, number of prototypes, the cost of the development, or the time that's taken. And you can see that in using computational analysis, these people are seeing significant reductions, 10% or so across the board, in the areas that are critical to getting your product to market and your technology to be dominant. Whereas those people that are still reliant on physical prototypes are continually seeing increases in costs, increases in numbers, because the, the technology is getting more complex, they're therefore locked into using more complex capability, more complex testing to be able to develop it. Obviously, this can't continue, so you have to look at moving towards this area where you're using computational analysis systemically to increase your revenue, but also to look at quality, reduction of cost, and on-time launch. A number of different things to look at. So this now leads us to uh, a view about what the future could potentially be. And I have to stress this is Altasim's view. We're not going to impose it on anybody else. But we see that there's going to be an extended use of computational analysis where you're now going to be using predictive physics to replace those engineering calculations that are either codified or they're just locked into an Excel spreadsheet. Those are approximations. They're good under certain circumstances you now need to be able to get more predictive so that you can use those results uh, with confidence to move forward. The other aspect that you look at is that if you can now extend it over a wider user base, it's going to get bigger acceptance, it's going to have a bigger impact. As an estimated 750,000 professionals, subject domain experts, such as the people in the audience here, who are using computational analysis. And yet, there are also an estimated 80 million scientists and engineers who are involved in product, process, and technology development. So you can see that 750,000 people are not necessarily going to be able to support 80 million. So you need to find a way of either increasing the subject domain expert numbers or finding ways of cascading that expert knowledge further down the tree to the users who can use it on a, a regular basis. And one way of doing that is in terms of these computational simulation apps that you've heard where there are simplified interfaces. I've just got some examples of ones that we've been developing here associated with design of heat sinks, additive manufacturing, and then processing of ceramic matrix composites. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about one of these uh, as we move forward. So the benefits of computational analysis are you can take an expert's knowledge of the type that's resident in here, but now you can make it widely available across a whole corporation, across a whole country, and you can make it accessible 24-7. It can easily be integrated into a corporate structure that has standard solutions. You can just make your app available on the server, and people can use it when and if they need. They don't have to wait for an expert to be at the other end of the phone to contact. They're definitely easier to use than CAD embedded tools, and because they're available widely, they're going to be more widely used than CAD embedded tools. And obviously, uh, we've got reduced software costs because we now have uh, re only required functionality is accessible through things like the console server. We get to two issues now in terms of deployment, and you can look at it in two ways, one of which is Proprietary apps that a customer may want to keep to themselves without releasing to the general public. Um, here, they're going to be customized to a specific need. They can deploy it easily within a corporate structure, either from a local server or a, a global server. And they fit into this standardized company solution methodology that may already exist, and you just put this other piece in there to improve the way they can work. The other aspect that is and perhaps a little bit harder to um, develop, but I'll show you some ways in which that's, this is now being addressed, is now general apps, where you may have a, 
solution that's applicable across a number of different companies and you want to make it available to individuals in both large and small corporations. Small corporations may not have the infrastructure to be able to support the computational needs that are required. So there are ways then of deploying this where you can either purchase it for internal use or you can now use this on a pay per use basis. And again, that's getting at this issue of taking 750 experts, 750,000 experts and applying it now to 80 million users. So the delivery mechanism, this was something that was touched upon uh, earlier in the week. We've been part of an organization that's called Awesome. It's an organization that's being led by the Ohio supercomputer that is conveniently located within Columbus where we are. Procter & Gamble and Intel are business partners in that. They're actually putting significant amounts of money into this particular initiative. And then we have some service providers who are looking at developing apps as well as developing the infrastructure to be able to support the deployment. So Awesome is looking to challenge the way in which conventional software is being accessed, but also provide a mechanism for accessing computational simulation apps. And you can see generically the approach here. Um, these would be developed uh, within a certain people who've got the capability of developing the, the codes as well as the access. They would then be accessed by a user on a central system that can then be done on a pay-per-use basis, a subscription basis. It's open for discussion how that works. And uh, it's, it's then run on either remote or local computers of varying size. Some of the ones that we're looking at, you require supercomputers to be able to do it. So this is the infrastructure that's being developed for deployment of these apps and delivery to the, uh, the mass market. So what I want to do now is switch it a little bit and give you an idea about an app that we've been developing and give you a demonstration of that. This app is uh, associated with identifying the appropriate design for attachment to microelectronic circuits to dissipate the heat that's developed in these complex circuits. Because of the increased functionality that you have on uh, chips, they're being run at higher powers, and consequently the power densities get very high. Some people have estimated in the extreme they're actually close to those on the sun. But you need to dissipate that energy because otherwise the components are going to heat up, they're going to exceed required operating temperatures for longer life. And the sorts of components that we're talking about here are control modules for production plants that have to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So you can't afford for these to be shut down. These are the things that are making your Pringles, they're making your pharmaceuticals, they're canning your beer. If you ran, if they did run down, it gets to be very expensive. So you need the long-term op operation and consequently, you have to dissipate the power in primarily what is, has been looked at as a passive mode through natural convection. You can't afford to rely upon the reliability of fans to dissipate the energy. So there's always debate about what the appropriate design of the heat sink that needs to be attached to this to dissipate whatever power levels you have without exceeding component and lifetime capabilities. So the app that we've developed is looking at designing these heat sinks that are going to be operating under natural convection. It does use the console server. It's got a simplified interface and is also compatible with cluster computing. And it automatically identifies how many nodes you want to run your, your app over. The results, uh, the automated analysis is set up within the app. It contains multiple functionalities of conduction, convection, radiation. It's focused purely on natural convection. It solves the whole problem of natural convection. And it provides you with an optimized design for the heat sink um, and also provides warnings and, and gives you capabilities to refining the calculations if they're needed. So the user goes in, uh, and we're going to run through this. He defines various components of the system. The analysis contains two levels, one of which is initial parametric sweep of the design to identify the optimum fin size spacing. And then there comes a recommendation about whether or not that's going to exceed component temperatures before potentially then going on to a full heat transfer analysis to be able to identify how close you are to the limits. All the settings within the analysis are automated 
And also in there is a selection about running on the cluster, how many nodes, cores you need to be able to identify. The result is generated automatically, complete with alerts or warnings to identify how close you are to the, the limits that you've set. This is kind of what the flow looks like. This is a typical interface, and we'll show some more details of it. And you would initially select what we call this level one analysis. It would come back with a report where you're plotting, uh, in this case, temperature against the number of fins on the heat sink. You'd identify where the minimum was. You can have a, re uh, a, a warning in here that if you exceed a certain uh, temperature, then you need to go to a, a further analysis, which is this level two analysis where we now take in the, the full convection conduction radiation within for that specific um, design. And then it comes back with what's the temperatures here on a, a more accurate basis. Now embedded in this are decisions about distributing this analysis over multiple nodes to get to the completion of the level one. They're also then taking the level two analysis and distributing it further because this is now a much more complex problem. Typically analyses in here to get the parametric design study will take 10 to 12 hours. One analysis from uh, in the level two level can be up to 16 hours to complete to get the required level of accuracy that you need. And really we're looking at people here who need that level of accuracy, need to be within 5% of the expected value. And that's where you need the fidelity and the accuracy. You need to have the uh, analysis set up to know that you have that level of fidelity. And that's where a lot of time and development has got into this app. So in terms of then deploying it, we've got it available for purchase on a standalone software system. We're also put it, setting it up to access on a pay-per-use basis through the awesome organization. So now we come to the demonstration, and as I said, this will be semi-live in that we didn't want to trust the connection between here and the supercomputer. So this is what the initial screen looks like, just the introductory, describes what the user has control over and input into, describes the two levels of analysis we've talked about, and describes the output. So from here, you would just select whether you want a level one or a level two. Go to the next stage, which now sets up your geometry, allowing you to select uh, spacing, sizes, etc., and the number of fins you want to run your parametric sweep over. The next input screen now selects the, uh, the conditions in terms of either ambient temperature um, what your power level is that you're trying to dissipate, and then also if you have some restrictions on materials that you want to be able to run under. And I'm going to preempt Rick's question later. No, this doesn't take into account graphite with its orthotropic heat transfer and isotropic heat transfer capabilities. Um, you can put in values for the thermal interface material that lies between the chip and the heat sink. And you can put in a, rec a value here that is the junction to casing temperature resistance, and this is where some of the warnings come in. So that's the standard for a given chip that is computed and given by the, um, the manufacturer. Then all you have to do is just press the compute button. I don't know whether this will work on here. It's now assembling the problem. It's identifying the size of the problem, and it's going to say how long it needs to distribute it. It then comes up and tells you you'll get an email once your job has started. You also then get an email once your job is finished, and you can go in and look at the results. So since we uh, baked one of these earlier in good TV cook fashion, you would then go to the results file. And this is the typical results display that you get for uh, the parametric study, you'll see there's a range of temperatures for different values of uh, number of fins that you have. It gives you the air temperature, the casing temperature, the maximum casing temperature, and also the, um, the heat sink weight, because this can be important depending on the materials you've looked at. But importantly, it also identifies where this minimum is here. And if we just scroll down, You can also put in here now at this point uh, a maximum allowable temperature that you have for your component. 
And if this minimum temperature exceeds that maximum temperature, tell you that you've exceeded your limit and you really need to go to a level two analysis to see how close you are to that. There are times when this analysis is accurate enough, but there are times when it's within certain tolerance bounds that we've identified that you need now to go to a more detailed analysis to ensure that you are below that value. And again, here it just says, this is a reiteration of it, just to make sure you want to do this, do you want to proceed to the level two analysis? So if you then go to the level two analysis and proceed with that and then look at the results, here's what you'll get from the results file for this. Obviously, we're just looking at one particular design. The parameters for this are automatically carried over from the level one analysis, and it gives you this temperature plot that you can spin and look at whatever you want to see the temperature distribution <coughs> over the whole of the heat sink. So um, that's how the app works, what it does. And as I said, this is in the process of being deployed um, commercially. So by way of summary, what we're seeing is that there are two potential evolutions of computational apps, one of which is for large corporate structures where you already have an existing unified approach that everybody in the organization has to follow. You can now capture the expert knowledge that exists within that corporation and maybe proprietary to that organization, encapsulate it in an app and make it widely available as a constant and recurring capability that the design and process engineers have access to early in the design process rather than having to wait for an expert to become available or for an expert never to be available and they have to guess. So that now you're in a situation where the results become predictive rather than statistical um, or their relationship or experience based. Now we're in a predictive physics based environment. Also for small and medium sized enterprises, these capabilities can be deployed for them to access on an as needed basis. This is gonna create a much lower barrier for them to enter into this market and see the benefits of computational analysis. The capabilities can be available 24 seven so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, that expert knowledge is encapsulated in the app and they can benefit from it without the expense of it. So again, the message is that simulation can be for everyone and is for everyone. The only caveat that we would add, add is, it's not just what you do with it, it's why you do it. And we have to make sure that it's available to everybody. Fortunately, with the capability that Comsol put in place, both in terms of multi-physics simulation as well as the distribution mechanism, this, com this Comsol community is probably at the forefront of this particular area. And it's up to us to make sure that that future makes use of this capability and con continues to advance the implementation of computational simulation for the development of future technology. With that, I'll finish. I'll take any questions that I like and care to answer. If I don't like them, I'll direct them to my colleague, Kyle Copenhafer. If he doesn't like them, then I'll be leaving through that door and Kyle will be leaving through that door. Thank you.